Five years ago this month, hard to believe it, huh? July 2016, our Western jurisdiction met in Arizona and elected a new bishop for the jurisdiction. Karen Oliveto was the senior pastor of the 12,000 member Glide Memorial United Methodist Church in San Francisco, a position she'd held for eight years. She was the first woman to be senior pastor at Glide, which is the fifth largest United Methodist congregation in the United States. She is the first woman to serve as a senior pastor of one of our denomination's 100 largest U.S. congregations. She was elected bishop five years ago and assigned then to the Rocky Mountain and the Yellowstone conferences. And in 2018, she officiated an annual conference where the merger of our two conferences occurred, creating our new Mountain Sky Conference. I had the distinct pleasure of serving with her on the cabinet for two years, and I was very glad when she appointed me to be the pastor of this great congregation in 2018. Also five years ago, same summer, I had major heart surgery. It was shortly after Bishop Karen was elected, and I spent all of August at home in my Billings, uh, home at Billings recuperating. During the third week in August, okay, before she's even officially on the job, before she begins her duties as bishop in September, Bishop Karen comes up to Billings to visit with the conference office, and she came to my house just to see how I was doing. And we chatted. And she prayed with me, and I thank you so much. And we celebrated her assignment to our area with a huge celebration in Bozeman in September of 2016. She is a dynamic leader, the first openly lesbian bishop in our denomination, a trailblazer, a teacher of justice and tolerance. In fact, Bishop Karen taught me food etiquette <laughs> and to understand that one should never put pineapple on their pasta. <laughs> so friends, would you join me in welcoming to our pulpit the Bishop of the Mountain Sky Conference, my bishop and your bishop, Bishop Karen Oliveto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, David, what I have to do to teach people how to eat well. <laughs> it is such a delight to be with you all today as you celebrate 150 years of faithful ministry. Give yourselves a hand. Excuse me, I'm trying to get, as David knows, I walk around a lot, so I need to get this mic just right. So excuse me a minute. There we go. There we go. Well, I give thanks for the way this church has nurtured faithful discipleship and has also reached into the community in healing and hopeful ways. Your past gives you a future with hope. Amen? Amen? May you live into it with a holy boldness that is so needed in our world today. Before I begin my sermon, I want to have a moment of personal privilege. When I began as Bishop of the Mountain Sky area, I was introduced to a cabinet that included David, as he said. And from day one, what I love and admire about David is his deep and passionate faith and his great love for all people. Amen. David, you wear your heart on your sleeve, and we are all blessed by your compassion and kindness. Thank you. Thank you.
There's someone else here that I don't get to thank enough who has been also with me since day one of becoming a bishop, my executive assistant, Nancy Cox. Nancy, you have been a vital partner with me in this ministry. I know I am the bishop I am because of your support, your care, your love, and I don't have enough words to thank you for the ministry we share. Thank you. You are such a gift to me and to so many. Please. So I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be led by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Amen. According to Dante, written over the gates of hell are those words, abandon hope, you who enter. Newspapers and evening news show us the gates of hell every night, and we are tempted to abandon hope every time we enter. We had hoped we had finally gotten to the other side of COVID-19 virus. We had hoped we'd see an end to youth violence. We had hoped that this politician would finally breathe new life into a tired and broken system. We had hoped we'd get more precipitation for this thirsty earth. Every single one of us knows what it is like to have hope and to abandon it. We had hoped she was the one. We had hoped the test would be negative. We had hoped he would stop drinking. We had hoped this time the baby would be brought to term. We had hoped the harassment and bullying would end. We had hoped. What is it that you've hoped for that seemed like such a futile thing to wish for, full of folly and wishful thinking that caused you to abandon hope. The cornerstone of our Christian faith is hope. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are shown that hope isn't some idle daydream, but a reality of faith that can raise the dead from their tombs. To have faith Necess necessitates having hope. You can't have faith without hope. You can't have one without the other. The theologian Paul Tillich marvels at how few philosophers and theologians, for that matter, take hope seriously. He said, they don't ask, what kind of force is it that, that creates and maintains hope even if everything seems to contradict it? Instead, they devalue hope by calling it wishful thinking or utopian fantasy. But nobody can live without hope, even if it were for the smallest things which give some satisfaction in the worst conditions, even in poverty, in sickness, in social failure. Without hope, the tension of our life towards our future would vanish, and with it, life itself we would end in despair, a word that originally meant without hope or deadly indifference. Do you, does this church have and live into hope? In our text today, we're told that in hope, Abraham believed even in the face of hopelessness, with everything was, when everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding not to, believe, not to live on the basis of what he couldn't do, but on what God said Abraham would do. This refers to Abraham's faith in the divine promise that he would become a father to a large nation, although he had no son and his wife was pretty old. There is probably no book in which the struggle for hope is more drastically expressed than it is in the Hebrew Scriptures. Those of the New Old Testament tried to maintain hope for Israel within the many catastrophes of their history. 
And later on, they even struggled as individuals for, that, for their personal hope. And finally, there grew a hope in them for the rebirth of this present world and a new state of all things. This dual hope for community and the individual became the faith of early Christians, and it is our Christian hope today. It is hope for the church of a, a new heaven and a new earth for which the individuals will enter this new heaven and new earth. But these hopes in both Testaments have to struggle with continuous attacks of hopelessness, attacks against faith in the meaning of life and against the hope for life's fulfillment. There is in the Old Testament outcries over the despair of life. There is the despair of Job when he said, the waters wear away the stones and the torrents away the soil of the earth, so God destroys the hope of humankind. Do you know something about that? Do you know something about despair, of hopelessness, that makes you wonder, how can I keep moving? There is this tremendous struggle about hope in the New Testament. It went on during the whole lifetime of Jesus, but it reached its height with his arrest. The disciples fled out of Galilee. The deepest despair and hopelessness was whispered between two disciples as they walked on that road to Emmaus, right? Their leader, their teacher, their beloved friend is gone. And they whisper to one another, we had hoped. We had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped, but what happened? He was crucified. In order to regain hope, they had, as it said in 1 Peter, to be born anew into a living hope, namely by the spiritual appearance of Jesus, which many of them experienced. Later on, the church had to again fight against hopelessness because the expectations of the Christians in the early church was the return of Christ, and it remained unfulfilled year after year after year. So they became impatient and felt betrayed to such members of his congregation. Paul said, now hope that is seen is in hope. But if we hope for that which isn't seen, we wait for it with patience. We wait. And the hardest part is that living with hope. The times in my life when I have been without hope have been some of the bleakest times for me. It was during those times of hopelessness that I stopped having a vision for a future held by God that I was being led to. I stopped believing in the promise of God who pledges to work through all our hurt, all our despair, all our sin, and mold it to something good. In those times of hopelessness, I began to live on the basis of what I couldn't do rather than what God through me would do. Every congregation I have ever worked with and known has at times lived for this, in this dark night of the soul of hopelessness. The bills were tight. The water heater blew. The chasm between factions and the church grew deeper. Discontent murmured through the congregation like the rising tide threatening to drown all semblance of, of Christian fellowship and love. The congregation started to stop living outwardly focused and instead turned inward. And it's true, the biggest kiss of death for any congregation is when it says, you know what, we have to start focusing on ourselves because we're not created the church isn't created. We don't live into it for us, but for those beyond our walls. 
when a church hides its light under a bushel, aware of its deficits, rather than claiming the power it has through Jesus Christ, clinging to what it couldn't do, rather than what God would do through them. How do you live? How does this church live? To live with hope is to always live under the transforming light of God's love and grace, and not only yourself, but your family, your friends, your community, your church, your nation, the world. And when you do that, God will never fail you. I don't know how many of you remember the, name, the, the story about Michael Wasser and Larry Trapp. Wasser was a cantor in Lincoln, Nebraska synagogue who hoped when everything seemed hopeless. Larry Trapp was the Ku Klux Klan Grand Dragon who saw that his mission was to harass, intimidate, and threaten Wasser with the ultimate goal of driving him out of town. When the chilling late night calls and hate mail began to bombard Weiser, he knew that it was who he, he knew exactly who it was coming from and he was afraid. But you know what? His response was one of hope, not hate, not fear. Weiser called his interrogator and got the answering machine. After listening to its pre-recorded anti-Semitic diatribe, he calmly offered to take Trap, who was confined to a wheelchair, out to the grocery store. For weeks, the cantor at the Jewish synagogue would continue to call up Trap and leave messages of hope and help for the grand dragon of the KKK. Finally, Klansman Trap called him back, complaining, what do you want? Stop harassing me. <laughs> but Trap soon called Weiser back with another question. He confessed, I want to get out of this life, but I don't know how. Weiser immediately responded, I'll bring dinner and we'll talk. His wife brought along a silver ring as a peace offering, and when they met face to face, the, the grand dragon and the cantor, Trap burst into tears. Trap eventually moved in with the Weissers, who cared for him as his health declined. In time, Trap converted to Judaism. Weiser never never stopped holding on to the hope that God could change even the most hate-filled heart. He had hope for his enemy, and the two became brothers. What kind of hope is that that holds on to the promise that God can change us even when we're mired in sin and turn our life around? What kind of hope is that that can help us face our most hate-filled enemy and trust that God will work wonders there? What kind of hope is it that can see past the, the despair of the here and now and look to the fullness of the future? It is a hope that has experienced and that continues to trust in God's grace for God never gives up on us, never is put off by the stench of our sin, never stops believing that we can be more than we currently are even when we stop believing in ourselves. Today, we are celebrating Heart of Longmont's 150 years of ministry. As I studied your history, and this is what I love, we're not celebrating 150 years of a building, are we? We're not even celebrating 150 years in this physical site. We are celebrating a church that knows that the church isn't a building, but it's its people. We are celebrating a church that wouldn't let a church building confine and constrict its ministry. From the first date of being organized, this church then built a two-story building a year later, then six years later a larger church, then 29 years after the first sermon was preached, another building broke ground, and this structure served you until the, no, not this structure, sorry, that structure served you until the late 50s before this one was built. 
your spiritual foremothers and forefathers kept investing in a church that was irresistible and kept drawing people to it. They knew that the church didn't exist for their comfort and care, but for the generations that would come after them. They had an unfailing hope for the future and made sure that that future would include the heart of Longmont Church. But now we're being asked to do the same. To what is your hope calling you and this congregation? Who will stand on the promises of your faithfulness? How will you use your resources to honor the past that your, of your ancestors who have prof- provided you with so much? That's our responsibility as followers of Jesus, both as individuals and a congregation. Our lineage traces back to Abraham, who in spite of being childless at the time, was able to have faith in God's grace. Hope became alive for he and Sarah. And we stand on their promises of faith. My brothers and sisters and siblings of the heart of Longmont United Methodist Church, don't you know your history is still being written? There is a ministry to which God is calling you to now. No one else has been given the call that you have. As you look back on your past, May you be inspired by all who went before you on whose promises you stand today. And as you reach for your future with hope, may you rest in the assurance that even when you most doubt if you could do it, God is equipping you for what you would and what you will do. There are generations to come that will be given new life in Christ as they stand on the promises of your faithfulness. Through the grace of God, we can live with hope, even when all around us, even when we ourselves see most hopeless. So let us each open our lives to receive the grace of God that not only can raise the dead to new life, but can enable us to live not on what we can't do, but on what God can do through us. Let us rest on our hope of nothing less than God's great love and grace for us. Amen.